Call up on page 33, calendar number 810, Constitutional Amendment, Assembly 2543. Secretary will read. Calendar number 810 by Mrs. Diggs, Assembly print number 2543. Concurrent resolution of the Senate and Assembly proposing the amendment to Article 1 of the Constitution in relation to providing equality of rights under law should not be denied on account of sex. Senator Whitaker. Madam President. Just a moment, Senator. Chair requests respectfully that the movement about the chamber cease and that there be some order restored in the chamber. Sergeant at Arms will keep the flow of traffic under control, keep the center aisle clear. Senator Winnicott. I rise to open up discussion on this amendment as the prime sponsor in this house. I speak today as a citizen of this country, the state, as a first-term state senator, as a wife of 14 years with a fine, loving, caring relationship with my husband, as a mother of two sons with the knowledge of what it is to have infants grow with inside of me, which in some ways is the most creative of all experiences. I speak today as a woman who in many ways has achieved as much as any person could yearn for. I have been serving the people for many years and hope to continue to do so. <laughs> but I wonder if I will ever sponsor a measure with greater import for both the present and the future than the Equal Rights Amendment. Today I stand as the lead name on a measure co-sponsored by 22 of my colleagues, male and female, representing the second passage of an amendment to the New York State Constitution, which will put before the people a clear choice. Shall we? as we enter our bicentennial year, reject the proposition that all men and women are created equal, or shall we affirm it and celebrate it? While it was my labor that brought forth both my boys, both my husband and myself are the parents with equal responsibility. Both of us, and we reflect the thinking of many Americans, know that the royal choice is not whether a woman can accommodate the careers of mother and wife or whether a man can accommodate the career of father and husband, but whether men and women can accommodate the often difficult but always rewarding multiple responsibilities of parents and spouse. To me, the family unit is most dear. And as a mother, I want my sons to grow up in a society that treats everyone equal, regardless of sex. This amendment that we have before us is not a new one in a variety of forms, but never differing in substance. It has been before the federal and state legislatures almost since the passage of the Women's Suffrage Amendment. It is not inappropriate to remember that it took us until 1920 for one half of our citizenry to have so elemental a right as a right to vote. The 14th Amendment proved to be a failed read for women because it took so long for even the most elemental of human recognition to be accorded the female half of our population. A group of suffragettes decided they had to press for an equal rights amendment to the United States Constitution. Only in 1970 did that equal rights amendment begin to have a real chance of success by which time men and women 
were thought of as individuals and not limited by accidents of birth. I want to reiterate, because it has not been said enough, that nothing in the Equal Rights Amendment interferes with the private relationship of human beings. We are talking about the action of the state. We are talking about the fundamental equality of individuals under the law. We are talking about that self-evident truth which constitutes the philosophical underpinning of our society. Senator Marlo Cook of Kentucky, Kentucky once pointed out that nothing in the ERA compels a man to be a gentleman, but nothing, on the other hand, compels him not to be. So it is true that nothing in the Equal Rights Amendment violates or constricts the opportunity of a woman to be a housewife, but neither, nothing compels her to be one. But simply and cogently, the Equal Rights Amendment is directed at offering to all human beings, be they be born a girl child or a boy child, the state's promise that they will not thereby be denied an equal opportunity to decide how to use and develop their individual personality. A number of questions, specific questions, have been raised about the direct effects of the amendment on various of our statutes and custody. Mr. Whitaker, will you suffer an interruption? There is discourtesy in this chamber. Will the sergeant at arms limit the flow of traffic? And only those senators who must leave the chamber, please, out of courtesy to the speaker and to the seriousness of this discussion, confine their remarks to business at hand and limit their movement in and out of the chamber. The chair respectfully requests that there be silence and that there be courtesy to each and every speaker so that this discussion may be expeditiously conducted. Senator Winnicott. Thank you. A number of questions, specific questions, have arisen about the direct effects of the amendment, questions that many of you as colleagues have put before us as sponsors. While I have the philosophical concepts, I do not intend or pretend to have the technical knowledge that I do not have. I am not an attorney. I have been a teacher, a consumer advocate, a local legislator, now a state senator. I am confident of my ability to make intelligent and productive decisions for the people I represent. But I am not prepared to answer the questions about the technical legal import of the amendment. I carry with me a very able senator to my left who I feel, in all fairness to the presentation, we would like to answer for our colleagues those questions that you have come at various times and addressed us with. Senator Burstein, will you yield? Senator Burstein, will you yield to a series of questions? I will. Senator Burstein. Senator Burstein, are you a full-time legislator? You are a full-time legislator, but do you do something else? Yes, I teach law. I'm a special professor of law at the Hofstra University Law School. What do you teach? I teach a course called Sex-Based Discrimination. Have sex. you... I teach a course called Sex-Based Discrimination. Have you been in the last year involved with the study of the questions of sex discrimination in all areas of our social life? And do you feel confident that you are relying responsibly to the questions I pose to you? I do. I do too. <laughs> we are now having... Would you be good enough to lift your microphone? It's very difficult to hear you at this point. All right. We have a number, a series of questions that many of you have posed to us. That's all right. And we would like you to, to listen to our answers because they, we think and we believe that they will answer all those questions that during the last couple of weeks many of you have posed. Senator Bursting. Are we having two people on the floor at the same time? Is that part of the rules or? 
Senator Santucci, it is perfectly appropriate, as you well know, for a senator to raise questions with another senator and to ask questions, and Senator Burstein has agreed to answer a series of questions. Do, are you raising some questions with Senator Whitaker? I was going to say that we'll answer any questions you may have. And no, I'm if sorry. that's the case, I think it's a yes. violation of the rules. Yes. Senator Winnicott is asking questions as far as the yes. chair understands it. Senator Burstein has just agreed to answer a series of questions. Senator Winnicott. Uh, Thank you. If I may, uh, uh, I, I just want to understand the discourse that's going to take place. And do I understand that you are now going to spell out the purpose and intent of the Equal Rights Amendment? Senator is going to ask Senator Burstein a series of questions. That is the purport of the present I, I understand. I understand, Madam President. I just want to know so that we can all uh, understand the uh, exchange that we are now spelling Senator, out what you, how you interpret Senator equal Gordon, rights. Uh, Senator yeah, Gordon, Chair correct. respectfully rules that you are out of order. The Senate, the uh, nature of the discussion will unfold as the questions are asked. Senator Gordon. Uh, Madam. What is your point of order, Gordon. Senator Calandra? Here we have the sponsor of the bill asking questions of someone else on an explanation of the bill. Isn't that improper? No, Senator, it is not. Senator Conklin. Madam President, uh, my question to the Chair lends itself to the uh, question that Senator Gordon raised, uh, I think that the record should show, if I understand the procedure here, that Senator Winnicott is reading her questions to Senator Braystein, and then she reads the answer back, which indicates, to me, which indicates to me that Senator Braystein knows the answers, and Senator Winnicott knows the questions. Senator, what is the point of order, Senator Einstein? As I understand it, Senator Winnicott is to ask Senator Burstein to yield the Senator Burstein has yielded. The Senator, of whatever Senator Winnicott may address to Senator Burstein is irrelevant in terms of any objections, point of order. We have a procedure whereby one senator can yield the question to another senator and as to the substance of that discussion really is their business and not the subject of objections from the floor. Senator Ornstein, your point of order is quite well taken. Senator Patterson. Madam President, I, I agree with Why Senator Ornstein. I'd like to inquire the chair whether or not it would be possible, as much as I would enjoy this vignette, to ask Senator Winnicow if she would give Senator Burstein the written questions, and then the time Senator spent... Senator Patterson, you're, you're out of order. Senator, pa Senator Ornstein, what is your point of order? My point of order is, is why is the Senator rising? <laughs> Senator Ornstein, you are out of order at this time. Senator Patterson, you are out of order at this time. Senator Winnicott, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Will you yield for a question, Senator Burstein? Yes. Will the state ERA compel women to be drafted and serve in combat positions? No. The draft, assuming it were to exist again, is a purely federal matter and not within the state's power to affect. However, we do have a state militia. Now, our organized militia is presently open to women under Article 1, Section 1 of the military law, subsections 11 and 12. The unorganized militia consists of all male citizens of the state of New York between the ages of 17 and 44. We would have to change this law. Senator Cameron. Uh, would Senator Winnicott yield to a question? No, no not at this time. Yield? I will be very glad to yield after we Senator finish Winnicott the presentation. Senator Winnicott refuses to yield at this would time, Senator. Senator Bernstein yield to a question? Senator, Senator Cameron, not at this time. Senator Cameron, Senator Bernstein refuses at this time. Senator Winnicott. <laughs> Senator, answer, so it is inappropriate to pursue it. Senator Winnicott. We weren't sure you could all read. So we can... Will, Senator Bernstein, will you yield to a question? Yes. Will the state ERA change the Social Security system? The Social Security system is again a federal matter and changed only by federal congressional or court action. However, we have provisions in our state laws which provide pensions, uh, pension benefits to widows. Those that do will have to be extended to cover widowers. Senator, will Senator Winnicott yield, please? No, I will Senator not at this Sermon time. Horn. Senator Winnicott. Refuse Senator Orenstein and... Well, it might refuse him, but she might not refuse me. Your point is well taken. Senator Winnicott, have you changed your 
mind about yielding. Unfortunately, Senator Skirmahorn is very close to my district. We share part of it, but I will not yield. Well, I imagine I'll get the same answer from Senator Burstein. There's a personality conflict here, I think. <laughs> Senator Winnicott. <laughs> Senator Burstein, will you yield for a question? Yes, I will. Will the state equal rights amendment compel women to go out of the home and support their husbands? The 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution <clears throat> prohibits involuntary servitude, and no state can force anyone to work to support a family. However, what the state can do is impose penalties for failure to obey a support obligation which it imposes through court processes. Senator Burstein, will you yield for another question? I will. Will the state ERA compel husbands and wives to contribute equal amounts of money to the marriage? No. Our support obligations will merely be defined in functional terms, and any awards made will depend upon the circumstances in which the parties find themselves, the length of their marriage, who has custody, and the capacity of the parties to support. Senator Burstein, will you yield for another question? I will. Will the state ERA change the grounds for divorce and the rules of alimony? Presently in the state of New York, all the grounds for divorce are equally available for men and women. There is one exception in the law of separation, and that is that a woman may sue her husband for legal separation on the grounds that he has failed to provide for her. That will have to be extended. That right will have to be extended to men in appropriate circumstances. Now, as for alimony, it is not an absolute right in our state. It is discretionary with the court, and it is always applied or awarded in terms of, again, the situation of the parties, the length of their marriage, the number of the children, the circumstances in which they have previously lived. That would continue to be the case in New York, except that we would have on our statute book a right for men to sue for alimony and for temporary alimony and for the council fees. And I think the people here will remember that last year we had a bill that did that and in fact passed the Senate. Senator Burstein, will you yield to another question? Yes, I will. What will happen to the laws that presently impose primary responsibility on the husband and father for support of the family? Our laws can no longer, under the Equal Rights Amendment, be based on the mere fact that one is a woman or that one is a, a man. They will instead, these support laws, depend upon the function and capacity of the spouse and the parent within the marriage. Now, happily, we have a lot of experience in this area. Indeed, there are 23 states, some of which have Equal Rights Amendments, some of them don't, which presently provide in their legislation that child support will be a mutual obligation of both parents, depending upon their respective means and incomes. And we have 35 states that have extended to men the right to sue for alimony. And I want to point out to you that nobody here has been able to demonstrate that in Mississippi, Missouri, New Jersey, Montana, and Connecticut, families are falling apart. Senator Burstein, will you yield for another question? Yes. What effect will ERA have on child custody disputes? New York law presently provides that custody awards will be made in the best interest of the child. There is no statutory presumption that either the father or the mother should have the child. It will be made, that determination again will be made in terms of which of the parents most properly ought to be the one who is custodial. Senator Burstein, will you yield for another question? I will. This is a question that uh, we seem to have received perhaps the most inquiries on. Will the ERA require that toilets be integrated? No. We don't have laws on our books in the area of toilets in any case, but, uh, but we will require that equal facilities be available to both sexes. Uh, Al Blumenthal once said, if there's soap in the men's room, there's got to be soap in the women's room. There does, however, exist a constitutional right to privacy, elaborated in literally hundreds of court decisions. And that constitutional right to privacy would, in fact, protect individuals of both sexes from oversight of private functions by the other sex. Senator Burstein, will you yield to another question? I will. Would state laws be affected with segregate prisons, hospitals, and sanitariums? Again, the sexes will continue to be separated on the grounds of this constitutional right of privacy, 
and by virtue as well of the state's continuing right to regulate the cohabitation of unmarried people. But again, what we must do is offer equivalent facilities and programs for the residents of these facilities. We've got to ensure that women in our prisons have the same opportunity for training, for work release programs, for education that our men presently do. Now, I, I would like to point out to you that we have a tendency to forget them. I remember a debate we had here just two days ago in which we kept talking about a man's liberty being at stake, as if, for example, Bedford Hills didn't exist. Senator, will you yield to another question? I will. Will a woman still be able to take the name of her husband? Certainly. It's important to know we have no law in the state of New York that compels a woman to take her husband's name. We do it as a custom. And under the Equal Rights Amendment, that won't change. People will keep their own names, they'll take their husband's names, they take their wife's names, or they'll take a new name, which they presently can do. Uh, the important thing, again, is to remember that our New York law is that anyone can assume any name, provided it is not with the intention of defrauding the public. Senator Bursting, will you yield to another question? I will. What effect will this have on our rape laws? The forcible rape statute, which really deals with unique anatomies of men and women, would not be changed. It would remain under the Equal Rights Amendment, but statutory rape, and one of the examples of that is, of course, intercourse between a man over 18 and a woman under 17 who is presumed not to be able to consent. Statutory rape would have to be extended or repealed. I would hope that as a public policy, the state of New York would act to protect the sexual and, and physical integrity of both young men and young women from attack by older people. Senator Burstein, will you yield for another question? I will. Will the state ERA affect the abortion law? No, absolutely not. The ERA is concerned with equal opportunities, equal access for men and women in areas where they both can function. Only women can get pregnant and only women can therefore have abortion. There is no question of sex discrimination here. Senator Burstein, will you yield for another question? I will. Will the state ERA sanction homosexual marriages? No. The state defines marriage as a union between a man and a woman. And this won't be affected so long as male homosexuals cannot marry men and lesbians cannot marry women. The state of Washington, which has an ERA statute in the same language as ours, has a decision from its highest court on this issue. And it held that the Washington law defining marriage as only between men and women did not violate the Equal Rights Amendment, that a challenge brought by two male homosexuals therefore failed. Senator Burstein, will you yield to another question? I will. What effect will the ERA have on such organizations as the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, Junior Chamber of Commerce, and similar single-sex organizations? We have a number of court decisions that are relevant in this area, and they strongly show that single-sex status will remain in private groups uh, of, of that nature. For example, the Supreme Court denied certiorari in a Junior Chamber of Commerce of Rochester case. Um, the case held, and I'll give you the site on that, which is 495 F. 2nd 883. That case held that despite a direct government grant and despite the existence of tax-exempt status, there was insufficient state action that nexus between state action and, and a private institution to force the JCs to admit women. Now, our federal Second Circuit has held the same thing in New York City JCs against U.S. JCs, and the Eighth Circuit held similarly. Senator Burstein, will you yield to another question? I will indeed. What about religious institutions? What effect will the ERA have on them? None. Religious institutions are absolutely protected by the First Amendment to the United States Constitution and Article I of our own Constitution against invasion by the state through the Equal Rights Amendment. That is a constitutional protection that exists coexistent co with the Equal Rights Amendment and it cannot be overturned by it. Senator Burstein, will you yield to another question? I will indeed. Will the state Equal Rights Amendment abolish protective labor laws? Well, New York State, in my experience, and just before I came here, amended almost all the labor law. Uh, a few of the statutes simply escaped our notice, and they are likely to be amended before the Equal Rights Amendment takes effect. 
In some cases in New York, our experience was we extended benefits to men uh, or women, depending on who had been the beneficiary before. In other cases, when those so-called protections proved to be really bars to opportunity, we abolished them. Uh, under all circumstances, however, our protective laws, our so-called protective labor laws, would fall as a result of the operation of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and of our own human rights law. Senator Bursting, will you yield to another question? I will. What effect does the Equal Rights Amendment have on the area of maternity leave? Well, I, I want to, there are three issues that have to be distinguished. First, it has already been held unconstitutional to force a woman to leave because she is pregnant, to leave a job. Second, if a state or any of its subdivisions as employers would have a policy permitting certain kinds of discretionary or health leaves, then a woman would have the right to take off to have her baby. And then if we had a policy of leaves which allowed people to care for their children, and we gave it to mothers only, it would have to be extended as it was by the City Board of Education in New York to fathers. Will you yield to another question, Senator Burstein? I will. Will private clubs now open only to one sex, which are licensed by the state to sell, serve liquor, have to be open to men and women equally? Absolutely not. We have a United States Supreme Court decision directly on point, Moose Lodge against Irvis, 407 U.S. 163, came down in 1972, decided that liquor licensing did not constitute sufficient state action to reach in and force Moose Lodge to admit blacks. Uh, if there were no even arguable state involvement, then there wouldn't even be jurisdiction in the courts to entertain a claim. Senator Burstein, will you yield for another question? I will. What will happen to a married woman regarding domicile? Well, we have a law in New York that allows a woman to establish her own domicile for voting and office holding purposes, but otherwise, for all other purposes, her domicile is in her husband. And that has actually very severe consequences. Take a New York State domiciliary who would be, who is in college now and who is eligible for one of the state scholarships. She marries a Texas domiciliary who happens to be stationed in Texas in the military. In consequence of that marriage, her residency is no longer located in New York but in Texas and she loses her access to state university, <coughs> or rather state grants. Now that would change under the Equal Rights Amendment because under the Equal Rights Amendment, a woman's domicile would be in herself, in her choice. Senator Bursting, will you yield yes. for another question? Yes. What effect will the Equal Rights Amendment have on school sports in New York? Well, it's going to compel us to look at the fact that we presently spend nine times more for, girls, for boys' athletics than, than for girls' athletics. But the ERA won't compel us to make exactly, in some abstract way, the same appropriations for boys and girls, it will compel us to offer equal opportunity and facilities without regard to sex. And I point out to you that we were already under that mandate as a result of the Federal Education Amendments Act of 1972. Senator Burstein, will you yield for another question? Uh, a moment. Senator Gordon, why do you rise? Uh, uh, I don't know no how, how to do this. I, I'm trying to get some clarification on the answer before we lose it. Uh, may I inquire? When we, when we yield, I think we'll be able to may, clarify. May I, would you yield so that I can ask the question? Um, I will not yield now, but we will yield at the end of the presentation to clarify that question, Senator Gordon. <clears throat> what will be the impact of this constitutional amendment on the pension and retirement system of our state? Well, we have, we have some figures on what would happen if pensions and retirement benefits were extended to both sex on a basis that was neutral as to sex, and there will be a cost to the state. Figures vary. But the fact is that we are under Title VII now in the courts on challenges to pension and retirement benefit systems. And I believe that they will succeed under Title VII. Uh, beyond that, and I think this is important, the United States Supreme Court recently compelled the federal government to extend benefits, in the Weisenfeld case, to widowers. And the reason they did that is they said that there was no way you could justify, on the basis of cost, a diminution in the values and the benefits and the rights of working women. Uh, the last question, Senator Burstein. How many laws are going to be affected by the Equal Rights Amendment? There is a, Senator Gordon has, has talked to this issue. He's talked to the Law Revision Commission. There is a note in the packet that 
were distributed by us on your desk, and I think that that note is uh, adequate answer to the question. Uh, the answer is that 700 have been looked at, about 200 seem to have to have some change, about 100 of which are cosmetic. Thank you, Senator Bernstein. I look again. Now, now with Senator Winnicott. Senator Gordon. One moment, Senator Gordon, and I will oh, yield. Right. I think many of these questions, and I know they were lengthy, but these were questions that many of you have put to us, some of which we, we have been able to confer with, but we felt that these were the leading questions that should be answered in part of this discussion. Senator Burstein, I believe, has answered those questions. It's quite fortunate to have a uh, colleague who is also an attorney. I do not intend, however, to argue all the questions, but I think Senator Gordon said yesterday about the judiciary amendment, his comments in terms of no amendment seems to answer all questions or no approach that has been brought into this body has been perfect and ultimate. I hope that by this presentation some of those questions have been answered. We will have given the people a chance to write a broad statement of principle into our Constitution, one that can by its general language be flexible and rich enough to accommodate the experiences of the future as well as the present. We will therefore charge ourselves to do the statutory revision that conforms our laws to that principle and assures our people of equality under them. I have heard in the past months objections that by passing the Equal Rights Amendment we place our destiny in the courts. That statement does a grave disservice to our power and dignity as a legislature. We will, if the people approve the Equal Rights Amendment in referendum this November, as I think they will, have the opportunity and the mandate to assure that this is indeed a state not divided on the basis of gender, but one which offers liberty and justice for all. Senator Gordon. Madam President, just one very brief question then. I, I just want to make certain that we all understand that the questions posed to Senator Burstein, and I think it's important to all of us, spell out what you believe the Equal Rights Amendment will and will not do. Is that correct? Yes. Not? And so, for, is that correct? Yes. And, and so towards that end, you have uh, now advised us from a number of questions that have come to your attention, uh, just exactly uh, uh, the purpose and thrust of the Equal Rights Amendment, in your opinion. I think I've indicated to you, Senator Gordon, there's a philosophical concept, a principle in our Constitution. There have been legal questions. I am not an attorney. And therefore, I thought it was necessary in making these presentations to have an attorney respond to that. Yes, I, I, I appreciate that. And I was only asking to make certain that the record, that the record did indicate that the answers related themselves directly to the thrust and purpose of the Equal Rights Amendment. That's all. Am, am I correct? Senator Winnicott, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I think yeah. the, the questions were intended to clear up. Oh. The intention of the question was to clear up some of the problems, some of the questions that have been raised by various of mm. our colleagues to many of us who have co sponsored the legislation. And it was an attempt to clarify it with a, an attorney who has that back. Thank you very much, and if I do still have the floor, Madam President. Yes, Senator Gordon. Then may I yield to Senator Hecker. Uh, Senator, uh, Myers, we had a list, Senator Gordon. Senator, the chair was being courteous to you, I, I, Senator, since you had the floor for a question, but the chair does have a list of Senators. Uh, Senator Eckert's uh, name can be placed I, uh, on I, that in list. In all fairness, uh, Madam President, uh, uh, there is an amendment to be offered uh, and uh, I would think that this might be in the that case, this is, 
appropriate time to offer. Senator, it. that's quite correct. For that purpose, there. I yield to me with you. Just a moment, Senator. Senator Santucci. Madam President, I'd like to ask a question of the previous speakers. Uh, Senator, Sen Senator Eckert, will you delay your, your uh, amendment for a moment? Senator Cameron, why do you rise? Apparently, Senator Winnicott and Senator Burstein, if I'm correct, were using a, a script or, or, or type questions and answers. Am I correct or incorrect in that? What is your point of order? of the debate today as every day is available to every member of this body. Senator Santucci. Senator Burstein, will you yield? It's appropriate now for Senator Ecker to be able to offer his amendment and that any questions that arise as a result of that or on the main bill can be debated Senator when we debate the main bill. At this time. No. Senator Ecker. <laughs> Senator Ecker has the floor. Topics are concluded. Senator Winnicott, do you yield at this time? Not at this time. I Senator Eckerd, Senator Winnicott refuses to yield at this time, Senator Santucci. Senator Santucci? Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Senator Gordon. Our understanding is that Senator Gordon has yielded the floor to Senator Eckerd. You recognized him, and therefore I think that asking anybody else to yield would be out of order. And I think in due reference to everybody in the state, not just the women, everybody in the state, we ought to have a serious debate on the issue, and I wish we'd continue with Senator Eckert. Madam President, if I may, the question arises as a result of something said by one of the speakers with regard to 100 laws that are affected, some 100 laws. And I would really like to know what laws are affected. And Senator Santucci, the speakers have indicated that they will answer in due course, but not at this time. Senator Eckert. Madam President. Offer up the following amendment, ask that it be read, move its adoption, and ask to speak on it. The Secretary will read the amendment. Well, it has to be read first. Yeah, I understand. Okay, we'll do that. The Secretary will read the amendment. By Senator Eckert, amend Assembly Bill Number 2543 as follows. Page 1, line 1. Strike out Senate and insert Assembly. Line 5, before the period, insert, comma, provided that nothing herein shall preclude classifications based on gender which have a compelling justification. Strike out lines 6, through nine, inclusive, and insert. Section two, period, resolves if the assembly concur that the foregoing amendment be referred to the first regular legislative session convening after the next succeeding general election of members of the assembly and in conformity with section one of article 19 of the constitution be published for three months previous to the time of such election. Senator Eckert. Senator Conner, why do you rise? Before Senator Eckert addresses himself to his amendment, I would like to ask uh, for the accommodation to, uh, to one of our colleagues that the last section be read so that colleague can vote. Uh, he's been called, he'll be called away from the chamber. Without objection. Senator Gallagher, do you object? One vote. It's on the amendment. It's on the amendment. Without objection? On the amendment. Read the last section. Or rate the resolution. Three. Senator Conklin, is this on Senator Eckert's amendment? This is on Senator Eckert's amendment. How do you vote, Senator Mason? I vote aye. How do you vote, Senator Mason, on the. <laughs> well, Senator Mason can't be recorded on the main, main motion. I mean, we. Senator Mason, Madam President, I'd be recording on the amendment. Is that on correct? the amendment. Yes. Senator I vote aye on the amendment. 
Senator. Madam President, I think it's my understanding that those who are present on the floor at the time an amendment, the vote on an amendment is taken, will only be recorded. That's correct, Senator. Well, Madam President, is he voting now? Yes. Senator, he's voting on Senator Eckert's he's amendment. On amendment. There is no way of knowing at this time whether Senator Eckert's yes, amendment yes, is going yes, to be adopted yes, and therefore yes, whether there is going to be the main resolution before this body at a later time in today's proceedings. And therefore, yes. there is no way of taking that vote. Well, Madam, Madam President, I, I would just like to once again repeat, it just seems to me that everything that I've been told in the eight years that I've been in this body is that on amendments you must be present and Senator, vote. He is it, present. Senator, the rule of this House is that if a member objects, then there can be no registering of the amendment. If you are registering a formal objection, Senator, are you? No. Okay. Without objection. In that case, it was appropriate for the chair to record Senator Mason's yes. vote. If one senator objects, then that vote will not be counted. If you object, Senator, it will be so held. Okay, yes. Thank you. Senator Mason's vote on the amendment is registered as an aye. Okay. Senator? And President, two years ago... On the amendment, Eckert's amendment. Senator Eckert, you have the floor. Madam President, two years ago I proposed that the rules of this body be changed to require that any amendment being offered up be placed on the desk of each senator unless one were amending his own bill. And although the Senate has never adopted this, this rule, I, I do want it to be known that a copy of my amendment has been placed on the desk of every member of the Senate. Senator Eckert, would you use your microphone? Why not? Madam President, members of the Senate, I think it's fair to say that all of us agree with the rhetoric of equal rights. It's an appealing, seemingly panacean slogan. But I think it's also fair to say that not one of us is certain of the consequences of the so-called Equal Rights Amendment. And that, I think, is an indication that we legislators should pause for some serious reflection and proceed cautiously before asking the people of this state to consider etching into our state constitution an amendment whose consequences we ourselves seem so uncertain about. One could say that in any legislation, including constitutional amendments, it is impossible to anticipate all the questions that might someday arise under them, that in due course, unanticipated, remote, perhaps esoteric problems may have to be faced. And I would have to agree that this is a reasonable statement about the reality of the legislative process. But what disturbs me on this issue is that so many recurring questions are raised and left unanswered or answered by expressions of uncertainty. I think it is fair to conclude that on this issue, there's either a lack of candor or a lack of comprehension on the part of the advocates. What does a mandate banning the denial or abridgment of equality of rights under the law really mean? It could mean that any classification based on sex must be justified by some good or very good or compelling reason. Or it could mean that no such classification can pass muster. It seems to me that ERA, as presently drafted, does not permit reasonable differentiation, no matter how compelling the justification. It is an absolutist, doctrinaire imposition of a single standard of sameness that leaves no middle ground for reasonable distinctions, however appropriate any distinctions might be. Thus, if the present wording prevails, it seems to me that the superintendent of insurance might no longer be able to approve lower life insurance premiums for women based on actuarial tables that do demonstrate that women tend to live longer than men. Separate athletic teams in our public schools could be unconstitutional. Sexually segregated dormitories in our public colleges could be unconstitutional. Sexually segregated prison cells could be unconstitutional. Even sexually segregated public restrooms could be unconstitutional. Homosexual marriages lesbian mar and lesbian marriages might have to be legalized. No one can declare with absolute certainty that this will happen, but no one can assure us that it will not. The advocates seem to answer by saying that they think the right to privacy would prevail, but they do not express that in the wording of their amendment. The very fact that they depend upon a counter principle to prevail illustrates the soundness of the amendment I have offered up. They are admitting that there are, in fact, considerations other than identical treatment that ought to be taken into account. 
then why not say so, crystal clear, in the wording we place into the Constitution? That's all I ask. What all this illustrates, in my judgment, is the better prudence of this legislative body's pondering the specifics of the alleged wrongs in our current laws and addressing ourselves to their fair resolution. Some will say that that takes time, that we legislators, who seem to have all the time in the world to devote to frivolous resolutions, are in effect too busy to say to the advocates of ERA, document specific abuses in the law and we will raise and debate them on their individual merit. It seems so much easier, so simplistic, to throw a catch-all phrase into the Constitution than to identify specific wrongs and draft the laws to correct them. Seemingly easier, perhaps, but not as sound. But whatever the fate of the amendment, sooner or later we're going to have to deal with specifics. Why not sooner? Why pretend that it is significant to admonish ourselves to do equal justice? Why don't we just go ahead and do equal justice? It is more difficult to cope with specifics than to ratify a politically appealing slogan and be able to escape responsibility for consequences by saying it's up to the voters to pass judgment on a matter that their duly elected representatives don't fully understand themselves. And if the courts, boxed into a corner by the language we force upon them, ever make rulings that run roughshod over common sense, it will be easy to rail against the courts and say that that wasn't what the legislature intended, when the truth is that no one seems to be able to clearly state what the legislature intends. But the problem with the easy path is that we don't know where it leads. And I say to you that if far-reaching and inflexible changes are to come about, if that is the true design of the advocates, let them demonstrate the courage to advance any radical changes through specific legislative proposals not through half-hidden implications of an appealing, seemingly innocuous slogan. Different people see this issue differently. I happen to agree with Professor Paul A. Freund of the Harvard Law School, one of the most highly respected constitutional scholars in America, who says, the real issue is not the legal status of woman. The issue is the integrity and responsibility of the lawmaking process itself. The choice in facing the ERA issue is, should we pass this amendment, the consequences of which we are so uncertain, and let the courts rule as they may, fully recognizing that, as Charles Hughes put it, in constitutional law, the law is what the court says it is? Or should we get down to specifics? Again, I agree with Professor Freund. The choice resembles that in medicine between a single broad-spectrum drug with uncertain and unwanted side effects and a selection of specific pills for specific ills. I'm a realist, and I recognize that the legislature of this state is not going to muster the strength to reject anything so attractively packaged and given such an appealing slogan. So I say, if something is going to be etched into the state constitution, let us make certain that we don't overlook reasonableness. At first, I intended to offer up an amendment identical to that proposed at the federal level by Senator Sam Irvin of North Carolina. And I spoke with Senator Irvin and sought his counsel on this issue. I also sought counsel from another great constitutional authority, Professor Freund of Harvard. In the course of several conversations, Professor Freund has persuaded me that the language introduced by Senator Irvin in Washington is not as desirable as language suggested by Professor Freund himself. That is, let the ERA amendment read. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the state of New York or any subdivision thereof on account of sex, provided that nothing herein shall preclude classifications based on gender which have a compelling justification. It would seem to me that the addition of the language of my amendment would remove any reasonable doubts about, uncertain, about certain undesirable consequences of ERA which have been speculated about. The language of my amendment clearly maintains the symbolic gesture and, of course, reinforces what I feel are already existing constitutional protections and legislative mandates banning denial or abridgment of equal rights on account of sex. It blocks invidious classifications while at the same time permitting the legislature and the courts to make reasonable differentiations 
where there is a compelling justification for doing so. This is the more reasonable approach. This is the more prudent approach. This is the more sound approach. And, President, I move my amendment. Senator Myerson. Madam President, at this time, I'd like to yield to Senator Gold. Senator Gold. Thank you, Madam President. Firstly, Senator Eckert, you talk about candor, but I think, in all fairness, what you really mean is delay, because that's what I and many others interpret your attempt to amend and the really unnecessary language which you contain, you, you contain therein. And if we want to talk about candor, then perhaps it's your side, if you want to call it that, that ought to come forward and let all of us know these very vital legal discriminations in the law that everybody wants to keep. And as far as this being an imposition, we're not imposing anything, because hopefully when this Senate acts, as the Assembly has, it will be the people who will decide whether or not this language will be in the Constitution. And the people, as with all our constitutional amendments, have the right to, I won't yield yet, have the right to impose upon themselves language in its Constitution. And I must take some bit of uh, disagreement with you on, on the word gesture. You say that you keep the language as a gesture and then go on to clarify it. Senator, neither I nor any other man or woman in this state want any gestures from you or anyone. They only want their rights, and they want it spelled out in the Constitution. I think it's interesting that you came today with an amendment which is different from the amendment that's been spoken about. And I think it's wonderful to talk about this constitutional lawyer and that constitutional lawyer. I think it's very simple. I think that the original language did not find favor with enough senators in this House, thankfully, and therefore you are attempting other language so that the defeat of your first language could be avoided. Hopefully, the Senate will appreciate what's being done and defeat both languages. But let's understand exactly what your amendment is and what this other constitutional amendment really is, too. It prohibits, Senator, discrimination, not classification at all. And I'd like to read to you just a few lines in our present Constitution. Article 1, Section 11. No person shall be denied the equal protection of the laws of this state or any subdivision thereof. No person shall, because of race, color, creed, or religion, be subjected to any discrimination of his civil rights by any other person or by any firm, corporation, institution, or by the state or any agency or subdivision of the state. That's where it ends, Senator. No record language in there. No need to worry about classification. Yet, we have laws in this state that do make classifications. And we have laws which forbid discrimination. I don't have to remind you of the work of Senator Flynn and many others who are concerned with discrimination because of age. And yet we certainly do have classifications. We do mandate that children of a certain age go to school. We don't mandate that adults do it. Somebody brought up insurance. Is there any doubt in anybody's mind here that a 35-year-old in New York does not have to pay the same life insurance premium as a 55-year-old? Is that discrimination? No, it's a proper legal classification. What about our criminal laws? Don't we treat young people differently than adults? What about voting rights, social security rights at the federal level? And what about color? Haven't we arrived in 1975 with, with, with court mandates and with legislation aimed at achieving proper racial integration in this country and in this state by making proper classifications to protect people's rights? And don't we have laws providing for bilingual education? Now, my God, those are perfectly proper classifications. Its constitutionality has been tested, and the courts have held it up. And it's under the same amendment that I read to you, Senator, without the Eckert language. We have situations now 
Uh, I, I'm sure you've read in the newspaper recently, there's a question in the federal courts as to whether a, a certain prisoner with religious beliefs can, man, can get certain kinds of food. Isn't that making a classification? The federal court judge that says maybe that ought to happen. Now, what about last year when this Senate was kind enough to consider a, a proposal of mine and it became a law dealing with alternate voting places in this state if people had certain religious beliefs? But it's a proper classification. I had somebody come to me today and tell me that there are places where they're afraid they're going to have co-ed prisons. And you mentioned it yourself. And I tell you, I find that particularly offensive because I've been involved in work in this state, in the Crime and Correction Committee. We can't, we can't do anything in this state to stop homosexuality in the prisons. And you're worried about having co-ed prisons. I think what's important to realize is that this is not just another law. We are talking about a charter, the Constitution, the mandate by which government is going to tell the people, this is how, or the people will tell government, rather, how this state is to survive, how it is to run. And I can't for the life of me understand the resistance of anyone to have language in the charter, in the Constitution, that says, thou shalt not discriminate. There shall be equality. If the only question involved is sex, if it be religion, if it be creed, or what have you. Senator, you say to us, what laws? How many? I say to you, what classifications? Are, are you concerned, for example, that, that we've had laws in this state which guarantee that women do not have to go to jury duty? Well, the federal courts have been handling that. And now the female single secretary may have to go to jury duty just like the single clerk in that office who happens to be a man. I'm not worried about that kind of a classification. And labor protections? So far, I've seen an awful lot of labor protections that protect women out of the right to work. They don't need that kind of protection. And I heard in a debate last week where in one part of this country where they've, they've made changes in the laws, my God, they've got women working 60 and 70 hours. And I asked that person, what are the men working? She says, well, we ought to cut it out for men too. Well, we ought to fix our labor laws for everybody. And I don't understand if this thing is so bad for, uh, for women, how come all of these labor groups, Coalition of Labor Union Women, uh, the state AFL-CIO, New York State M M Nurses Association, New York State Women's Political Caucus, Congress of Labor Union Women, they don't seem to want these protections that you want to give to them. I've heard mention today of maternity leave. And again, there was a case, and it was in the city of New York, where a man went in. He says, yes, my wife had the baby, but she needs me at home. And the court gave that man maternity leave. And why shouldn't our laws allow maternity leave for a family if the man is needed at home, just as the woman? I've got a short list here of some of, some of these laws. I don't know whether these are the ones you mean. Section 203B of the labor law provides that if you have so many women working in a factory, you've got to have so many seats available. Well, you tell me men don't get tired either? Are you afraid that that kind of a classification is going to be ruined? Are you telling me that the general business law, which provides certain rights for widows, is the kind of law you're worried about? You mean to tell me that when women work and earn rights and God forbid something happens to them and a husband is up with a family, these laws may someday provide for the widower? And we have, a, we have a, a section of the executive law similar to that deals with the widows of state police. If there is a woman working in our state police and God forbid killed in a line of duty, what's the matter with the state or saying in its laws that the widower is also going to be protected and the family is going to be protected? I have one here, uh, the general business law, that says an employment agency shall not send or cause to be sent any female as an entertainer or performer to any place which the employment agency knows or should have no knowledge to know that requires females to sell or offer to sell or to solicit the purchase of intoxicating liquors to those present. You afraid of that one? That one's violated every day of the week. We have women. You afraid of that classification for them? Seems to me now, what we're talking about here 
again, is our charter. And you have the obligation. If you think that there are discriminations in our law, classifications in our law, that you're afraid are going to be taken from these women to show it. Our women are in a very difficult position today, certainly in fighting for this legislation, because all they're really asking for is equality. That's the language, equality of rights under law. But so many of my colleagues, so many people around the state want to keep women on a pedestal and say, you're a bunch of kooks if you want to come off of there. You don't seem to hear the outcry that says, you've got to earn a place on a pedestal, you've got to earn a reward, you've got to earn a medal. And just think of how degrading it is to live in a society where the concept is that we are going to place you on a pedestal with an underlying concept that we have the right to make that determination. As if the right of a female in society does not come from other things than the graciousness of masculinity to yield to it. Senator, I don't know what this status quo is that your First Amendment was concerned about or what these classifications are that you're concerned about now. Madam President, I know that in your case, there were men in politics who weren't sure whether the state was ready for a woman as a candidate for lieutenant governor, and apparently the people were ready for that. And it may just be that the people are ready to tear down the doors of discrimination and prejudice by a constitutional amendment, and they have that right. But Ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to give them that right, you can't give it to them in a piece of paper that, in effect, Senator Eckert, is going to say, yes, there's a right, but we're going to keep the wrongs. I know there are people against DRA and that some of the people here will actually vote against it today. But I urge upon you, very seriously, don't take the cop out. Don't go for the time delay if you want, if you're against it. I assume that you will do what you think is right and vote against it. But there's no logic to this. The logic that says to the people in one piece of paper called the, the Equal Rights Amendment with the Eckert Amendment that no, we shall have equality under the laws at all times, no discrimination, but if we like what we've got, we're going to keep those discriminations. Seems to me the people have a right for us to be more forthright than that. And they, don't, they have a right not to have us engage in this tomfoolery on a day that should bring great dignity to this chamber. I say to you that once and for all, the people have a right to say, quotes, there shall be no good discrimination and bad discrimination. Discrimination is out. People are people, regardless of the accident of birth that makes them a male or a female. This is our charter, our constitution. And along with those great guarantees of no discrimination based upon color and creed and religion belongs no discrimination as a result of the accident of sexual birth. But even more basic is the right of our people this year to add dignity to our constitution by in November having the choice to put into our Constitution the language of the Equal Rights Amendment as passed by this legislature during its last session and hopefully this session. And I say to you with all of the rhetoric that we will hear today and the rhetoric that has gone on in the past weeks, the people out there understand they understand that the question is, will we or will we not have the opportunity in November to speak out body? And I urge upon everybody to defeat this amendment and every other attempt to delay this question from reaching the people. Thank you. Does any other senator wish to speak to the amendment? Senator Skirmahorn. Well, thank you, Madam President. Um, I think I'd like to reach back a year from uh, this session and uh, remind everyone here that I was the lone speaker 
against the Equal Rights Amendment as in its original form as it was passed last year. And there were only four votes against the amendment at that time. My friend Senator Padovan and Senator Donovan and Senator <laughs> Eckert. And uh, your sure does make a difference. I spoke to Senator Eckert at that time and I said, uh, since you did vote against it, how come you didn't get up and speak? He said, well, I didn't want to be identified with you. But yet here, <laughs> today, after uh, 12 months of additional information, uh, he has proposed an amendment that would protect the rights that a lot of people enjoy today that we do not want to see done away with as a result of the ERA that Senator Winnicott proposes. Now, I can't understand what the hurry is. The courts over the years have drafted legislation and they've passed it and it's in the law to protect women. And the women that it protects are those who are totally dependent on their husbands for support. Now, if you talk to these women, they don't think they're second-class citizens, Senator Bernstein, as you would, might lead them to believe. They were given these additional rights because we felt they were entitled to them. Now, what greater contribution can anyone make to our society than to raise honest, law-abiding children who regard their parents with love and honor in their country? Well, most of all, these disturbances in the chamber seats, the sergeant-at-arms will clear the gallery. That must not happen again. The rule of this chamber is that there is no demonstration on any side of any issue by any visitors to this gallery. Uh, what greater contribution than uh, also who uh, regard their country and its laws with pride and their fellow Americans with respect? And in today's world, I think that's a great contribution. I, I know of no individual group of people that make a greater contribution to, than to society than the mother makes. And I say they're not second-class citizens, and they're the people that oppose this amendment. They're the ones you're trying to protect, and they don't need your help. Now, any person in this chamber, or anyone within the sound of my voice, or anyone that is going to vote in November if this amendment uh, is passed here today, that has a daughter, better vote in opposition to this ERA. And as I left Monday morning, my daughter, who will be 16 years old, which I have four, said to me, uh, I hope you're successful in convincing the Senate that the ERA should be amended because I really do not want to be drafted. And I don't want her drafted. I want the gals that have had this protection over the years to continue to have this protection. Now, Senator Bernstein said, this is a federal statute, it's a federal act. But she's trying to lead you to believe that it's not going to be ratified by 38 states, even if New York State passes it. And if it is ratified by 38 state Senator, would you yield for just a point of Same inquiry? Same question I received from Senator Winnicott. Same answer. Then you will yield later. I will point yield at any time after I finish. Point of information, Senator Gold. Yeah, uh, l l lest I be mistaken, uh, are we on the, uh, the, the Winnicott bill and Eckert's amendment, which deals with the New York State Constitution ERA, or have we regressed a few years and gone back to the federal Senator ERA? Gold, your point is well taken. This is the bill, the resolution, which deals with the New York State Constitution. Uh, Madam President. No, this, this is... <laughs> Senator, raise the point of order. <laughs> Senator, don't raise the point of information, Senator Spermahorn, and the chair was answering his point of information. I'm sorry, just for the record, I, there was no doubt that it wasn't germane in my mind. <laughs> Senator now, Spermahorn. If 38 states ratify this, then Congress will lose its power to exempt women from the draft. Now think of what would happen if there were subject... Porter. If this would have passed today, is there any requirement that this be ratified by any other states in the Union? Senator, there is no such requirement. This has nothing to do with any other state in this Union. Thank you very much. What is your point of order, Senator? Senator McCall has interrupted Senator Scamahorn twice. He rose before and said this should be a debate of some dignity. I agree with him, order? and I suggest that Senator Scamahorn nor the speaker be interrupted again. Your point of order, if there was one, Senator, is not well taken. Senator Scamahorn. I'm going to lose my place here. <laughs> Congress will lose their right to exempt women from the draft. And I said, think of the far-reaching effect this would have. 
We have heard of the atrocities that, have been, uh, that men have been subjected to when they're taken prisoners of war. And on a limited basis, women have been taken prisoners of war and horrible things have happened to them. Horrible things have happened to them. And I hear the rhetoric, we want to be treated equal and we'd like to go into service and get in the front line. So volunteer if you want to go into front line. Volunteer. I'll support legislation that any woman who wishes to volunteer for the draft be put immediately in the front lines. <laughs> I have no hang up about that. But I want to protect the young ladies today. I want to protect their right to be exempt from the draft. I want Congress to have this on to give them this protection. They don't need equal rights. They're not asking for it. You take care of yourself, pass your separate bills to give you what you want, but leave the other guys alone that are protected under the statutes that presently exist, be they state or federal. Now, Senator Gold, you talk about are we afraid to amend the Constitution to give all people equal rights? And I'd say, no, we're not. In doing so, don't take away privileges and rights that other people presently enjoy. Separate legislation that addresses itself to separate issues, I'll vote for. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was a good act, and it made everyone equal, regardless of whatever category you put them in. And it was acted upon again, I think it was in August of 1974, to clarify language. This in no way is going to give extra benefits to people that are enjoying them under present statutes such as the draft exemption. This is going to take away these privileges and these rights. And Senator Burstein, when you're answering the questions that uh, Senator Winokow was uh, asking you, you said on Social Security, this has no effect whatsoever on the Social Security law. I heard you say that, I assume. Only if 38 states don't ratify it, Senator. And if 38 states ratify it, a woman will lose her rights as a beneficiary under her husband's Social Security. That is a question that has not been answered. And I say that a woman who has not qualified as a result of being married most of her life should get this benefit. And I was talking with a, a gal who was quite versed on this subject, and I asked her this question. I said, I'm 47 years old, my wife has, and I have four children. In the event uh, of my death, would she lose the benefits that I, that she now would get under my Social Security? Because she has never earned. You're shaking your head no, Senator, but this hasn't been ratified by 38 states. She said, if she does, the hell with her. Now, I'd say... Well, I'm going to I just want to be able to follow this debate. I thought we were on calendar 810, which is a resolution to the uh, proposing an amendment to the New York State Constitution. Now, am I correct that this is the... We are on calendar 810, Assembly number 2543, an amendment... A proposed amendment to the New York State Constitution. That's correct, Senator Bellamy. This is an amendment to the New York State Constitution. She's right. I'm talking about 38 states ratifying this, Senator. That's what I'm talking about. Of course, right now, you're only amending the New York State Constitution. But if 38 states ratify, we're going to affect federal statutes. Now, we talked about, and this lady seemed to know what she was talking about, people enjoying the rights of being a beneficiary under the husband's Social Security. And there's a question as to whether they would still have this benefit in the event this is ratified by 38 states. The question hasn't been answered, and I'd like to have it answered by someone who knows what they're talking about. I, you get no's on one side, yeses on the other, so it's still a question, so what's the hurry with this constitutional amendment? And we talked at great length about discrimination based on sex. And one of the topics was the destructive effects of the state ERA as it pertains to laws dealing with public morals. Now, the proposed state ERA would outlaw any discrimination on the basis of sex. And that sounds simple, and it sounds plain, but the implications are as wide as the world. To have no discrimination on the basis of sex means nothing can be done for or against anyone on the basis of sex. And more concisely, any law which has reference to sex, whether it be sex as gender or sex as activity, could be patently unconstitutional and therefore null and void. Now, ERA 
would create enormous havoc on our state and jeopardize the lives and the safety of every person, especially our female people. Consensual sex crimes laws could be ruled unconstitutional because these statutes now define sex crimes according to gender, which is discrimination by sex, hence to be forbidden by a state ERA. I didn't say will, I said could be. The question is still unanswered. Incest could become legal, could become legal under ERA because it would become unconstitutional to forbid sexual intercourse between close relatives. Father, mother, son, and daughter are sexual terms, and to use them in a statute may be discrimination on the basis of sex. Maybe. We don't have the questions answered yet. I can't understand the haste when there's still question marks on such serious issues. Statutory rape could be permitted under ERA, since the statutory rape law is defined in terms of gender. Consensual sodomy could be permitted under ERA for the same reasons. Any sex act performed by an adult with a consenting minor could be permitted under ERA. Could be. It was raised at the hearings, and it was not answered. It's still an unanswered question. Mere sexual activity could not be banned because to do so would be to discriminate on the basis of sex. Hence, most carnal abuse laws could be voided. It's an unanswered question. They could be voided. Besides, a minor is a boy or a girl. In terms of gender, also precluded from consideration under ERA. Homosexuals and les lesbians could be permitted to legally marry and adopt children. Could be. Because I even noticed that Senator Gold didn't mention it, that the endorsement of this ERA is from the Lesbian Feminist Liberation. He didn't mention that one. According to ERA, a marriage license could not be denied on the basis of the sex of the applicant. And the same for homosexuals and lesbians under ERA could not be denied employment as teachers, student counselors, legislators, firemen, policemen, armed forces, personnel, or government workers, even in high-level security positions. That, those unanswered questions are probably the most critical ones that need to be answered prior to the passage of this amendment. The Roman Empire began its moral and spiritual decay when concepts such as incest and homosexuality were accepted. A nation's strength, in our opinion, is in its moral and spiritual fiber. The elimination of gender from the penal law will encourage our moral decline and we too, not only the state, but this country will deteriorate and fade as a world power. And what I'd like to know is, what still isn't answered, is what does the Equal Rights Amendment really mean? And none of you have answered it either. You're saying that we may have to change these statutes, but what you're doing is you're passing an amendment to the Constitution that is so far-reaching that I think hundreds of laws are going to have to be looked into. We should look into those first. As I said here, when they were going to pass the bill to allow 18-year-olds to vote, I can't remember how many statutes had to be changed, but several bills had to be introduced. And I said, I will vote for that bill. I will give them this additional privilege of voting in our state and in our country if you make them responsible and change the laws that treat them in minors. We do the other things first. We seem to give the opportunity and the, and the privilege before we give the responsibility. And we're doing the same thing here. I'm not against equal rights for anyone. But I don't want you depriving people of things that they're entitled to that were thought over by many brilliant men, many legislatures, many Congress, and passed and signed into law. Are you on doing all of these things? I say you are. And you, Senator Burstein says, when it was asked, will it wipe out many protective labor laws which benefit women? And I think your answer was no. I'm not sure. I didn't understand your answer. It was a little lengthy, and I really didn't think you answered it. It was a political answer. I say it will wipe out a lot of the labor laws that protect women, and I want them to be protected. It'll eliminate all girl and all boys' colleges if they receive any federal aid whatsoever. You said it wouldn't, but it will, Senator. 
You haven't answered that question beyond any reasonable doubt. It will create havoc in our prisons and reform schools by preventing segregation of the sexes. It will. If it won't, you've got to prove it to me because you haven't beyond any reasonable doubt. That's why I say wait. You're not willing to wait. We rushed it through last year. There was nobody here. Because everyone thought it was an innocuous piece of legislation. Equal rights. But then we started to take a look. I took a look before it was passed. More people are taking a look. When there's questions such as this, still unanswered on such a major change in our Constitution, what are we rushing for? What are we rushing for? Let's get the questions answered beyond any reasonable doubt. The life insurance, lower rates for women, absolutely they will not get a benefit here, even though it's proven by statistics and by actual tables that women live longer than men and they can get life insurance at a lower rate. Life insurance companies will charge the same rate as they do for men because it would be discriminatory not to. It would be discriminatory. And we're going to be here fighting for our rights then. It'll transfer jurisdiction over women's rights, including marriage laws, property rights, divorce, alimony, child custody, and inherent rights, inheritance rights, out of the hands of the individual states, if 38 states ratify this, Senator. Please don't leave this in New York State, because if we pass it, there's going to be some other states that will believe that we know what we're doing and that they're going to pass it too. It'll take it out of the hands of the state and put it in the hands of the federal government. And I am absolutely and totally opposed to federal government mandates and controls over the lives and the destiny of the people in the states, and I don't like the states mandating to the counties. The least government is the best government, and the least laws we pass here are the best. I have a sign in my office that Senator Cameron gave to me, and it says it's your, your life and your property and your rights are in jeopardy as long as we're in session, and I told him we proved it that day. We're proving it again here today. And I've, I've had to adopt, assume this position, or I might add too, if anyone is interested, I am interested, but I, I assume my position before I receive their position. But the Conservative Party are in favor of the Eckert Amendment and opposed to ERA in its present form without the Eckert Amendment attached. That doesn't mean anything to a lot, but it does to some of us. But I had my position before they had come out with theirs. Now I'd like, Jimmy, we may just got a vote, eh? Do you pass this over to Jimmy? <laughs> I say this with all due respect to the people who genuinely are in support of ERA and who do debate in favor of it in good conscience. But a lot of them, in my opinion, the people that support this, are really not out to protect women. I think they're in competition with men, and we don't want to be in competition. I don't think, they're, I don't think their efforts are in, in, on behalf of women, because if they were on behalf of women, they'd accept the Eckert Amendment to leave the statutes in effect to protect the women that need and want this protection. Now, the question was brought up about abortion, and uh, it hasn't been answered yet. It hasn't been answered yet. Let me read you the answer from the supporters of the uh, Equal Rights Amendment. Will the state ERA affect the abortion law? And their answer is no. And their reason behind their answer is the ERA is concerned with equal opportunities. All right. Access and rights for men and women in those areas where both are capable of functioning. Okay, the question still isn't answered. Only women have babies, and that's true. And therefore, only women can have abortions, and I agree with that. There is no sex, dis no sex discrimination involved in either matter. All right, well, will it affect abortions? You didn't answer the question, but let me tell you this. Anybody here that, is, that supports right to life, you better be careful about how you vote on this thing because today's laws say this, state laws and federal statutes. Women are denied the so-called right. They're denied a right, which this is going to give to them, to have an abortion after 24 weeks. That's a right that they're denied. They can't have an abortion in the 25th or the 26th week. But this is going to give it to them, I believe. We have another position taken by hospitals in my district that you can't have an abortion after 12 weeks. Conscience is catching up with them. And to quote Mrs. Daly, the wife of the famous mayor 
from Chicago. She said she would rather have her children on her knee than on her conscience. You know, right now we're faced, too, with quota systems uh, so far as equal rights are concerned. And I wonder, it might be rather humorous to say this, but if we're going to uh, believe in equal distribution in our educational system, in other words, say, go for busing to achieve a so-called racial balance, why not bus to achieve a sexual balance? Let's even out the boys and girls in the school system. It would be right in me to do if this bill passes. If you have three or four schools in a district, let's balance out the boys and girls equally. It may seem like something that is humorous, but believe me, this bill, this amendment reaches much further than you believe. And what's wrong with Senator Record's amendment? I can't see a thing wrong with it. All he does in his amendment is he accepts the thrust of Senator Winnicott's uh, Equal Rights Amendment, and he adds one little, three little sentences, provided that nothing herein shall preclude classifications based on gender which have a compelling justification. That doesn't deny anyone's rights, and does it delay it? Of course it delays it, but it should be delayed because of all the unanswered questions. I want the present statutes that are right, that are meet, and that were passed by Congress, passed by state legislatures, to remain in effect. And I'll go back three or four weeks ago. We had the votes to pass Senator Record's amendment. We had the votes on the merit of Senator Record's amendment. Merit. That went out the window within the last two weeks because of the political arm twisting and pressures that people were subjected to here. And who, the, who do we give in? Who do we give in to? We give in to the people who seek our defeat. On the merits, we had the vote. On the political pressure, we lost it. The women, the women who support Eckert's Amendment, who want to retain the privileges and the rights they have today, did not speak out fast enough. I'm sorry for that. I only hope that we listen here today, we do not act in haste, we take a harder look. November is a long way off. We've got time. I'm willing to stay here until all of these questions are answered beyond any reasonable doubt. Let me leave you with this. A woman or a man is liberated only when she or he is a master of his or her own desires. Your pride, your vanity, and your selfishness. These are the things that enslave a person. Not diapers and oatmeal. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Gall yes. Senator Gallagher. I have some very short layer problems with the ERA amendment. And I'll deal with those later. But I think, very frankly, the amendment that we are considering now is actually a stick to chase women back to the kitchen. I think this amendment smacks of something very basic in our country. Our forefathers, I correct that, your forefathers, put a great deal of effort into writing that great instrument. Within the frame of that instrument, numbers of things can happen. The senator would suggest that he spoke with the senator of great notoriety, Senator Irvin. I suggest that Senator Irvin, in his wisdom, said, Senator, I was in error. Because what I was attempting to do is to dictate those rights to a group of persons that I have absolutely no right to do so. Senator, I voted against the amendment originally. I voted against it because I suspect that those of us who in good faith think that we can talk to other persons, and I did, we took the posture at that time that unfortunately we had no women here. And that we had the audacity and the nerve, the temerity, to think that 
I understood the rights of women better than women. And I was wrong, and I was fortunate, because we had an opportunity on mere technicality for it to come back to this chamber, and I voted for it. The amendment in reality is a delaying tactic, and we know this that if we pass this amendment, what we're really saying is that we're not really ready or prepared to give equal rights to all people. And those of us who are steeped in concepts of human rights must of necessity recognize that this amendment would merely prolong what is ultimately needed. Nothing short of full equality is acceptable in this country of ours. I suspect, Madam President, that it would be my hope that in the very near future that we would have more women as part of this legislative branch of government. And this is a possibility. This amendment, uh, if defeated, will give us an opportunity to say to persons that you have an opportunity to participate in a real sense of the word. We talk about equal rights and responsibilities for all. And I think when Senator Irvin's amendment, which had the effect of blocking, I don't know. I don't believe, however, that was his intent. He followed the lead from a senator before, I believe his name was Hyde who had indicated that what is needed is more different rights for women, different rights than men possess, the right of citizenship but no responsibility or duties. I think the amendment that we must of necessity defeat is going to open up the door to talk perhaps on another level. We know, well, perhaps, let me take this opportunity, since there is so many that wish to speak that I don't want to come back yet. Let me deal with my third and fourth category of concern. I wonder very frankly, Madam President, the impact that ERA will have on black women. I only wish that they were here represented so they could speak, because certainly they're qualified to speak better than I. I would wonder, within the frame of what we're attempting to do with ERA, that we might find ourselves as a... Body rise. Will the Senator yield? Senator Gallagher, will you yield to the question? He feels yes. Uh, you talk about black women. Estella Diggs, the summer woman Estella Diggs, wasn't she the main sponsor in the uh, assembly? Isn't she black? To be responsible, there is no question about assembly woman Diggs' identity as a black woman. I represent the other portion of the sect of my district in 1975. What I'm alluding to was snow, Senator. What I'm saying is that there is no one in this Senate no black woman here to speak on this bill within the frame of the rules of this Senate. That's what I'm saying. You're implying that uh, a white woman, a white man could not speak, uh, have the empathy to understand or uh, have black constituents in this district that they have heard from and want this piece of legislation? You're not implying that, are you, Senator? I'm implying, Senator, no, I'm not implying. What I am saying is that as we deal with a racist society that we live in, okay, that there are those, whether it be male or female, who are part of a racist society which has been documented through various reports on a federal level, I seriously question whether or not the impact of ERA, what will be that impact as far as minority women are concerned. Let me give you an example to make it live for you. I know for a fact, and I don't usually go this route of pointing out isolated situations, but I know for a fact that we had occasion 
just recently in state government where a black woman was being considered for a very high post in state government. That person was approached by other high officials in state government of different color, perhaps same political difference, different, uh, same political identification. It was suggested to them, to her, that she withdraw her name from consideration for a governmental appointment because she could not identify with that select group. If this be a pattern, and I know that it will not be, and I'm saying to you, Senator, that this is something that I am deeply concerned about. Senator, because I, I refuse to yield anymore until I finish. These are the things that concern me, Madam President. But overriding, because I know that most things that come and move, that this will not be a serious concern, serious enough for me to vote against the ERA amendment. But I think I would have been remiss if I did not bring this to the attention, did not say that this is some deep concern of mine. Madam President, I hope that the amendment will be defeated. I hope that the, the amendment, the ERA amendment, will pass, because certainly I intend to vote for it, and I also intend to vote against the Eggert Amendment. Madam President. Senator Beatty, what was your question? Senator, I don't want to prolong this, but all I'm saying is that I don't see your logic, I think it's specious, in one connection because a few women came forward and said that they thought that somebody were not aggressive enough to lead some bill or something like that. Yeah, Presumably that's what you're alluding to. Now that's what I'm saying, and Senator. I, I don't think it has anything to do with uh, equal rights. You could have had someone who might have thought somebody was too aggressive. Right. Then, Senator, I suggest that if you don't believe that those of us who are first just basically and firstly removed from footnotes, if you don't believe that that represents what I'm discussing, then I perhaps I suggest, in all due respect to you, Senator, that you're a bit naive. Well, I'm a little deaf, uh, Senator Preston. No, you're not, Senator. <laughs> what I'm suggesting, Senator, is simply this, that what we're talking about so, so very long is that we have an opportunity too often to speak up for some basic things that we believe are right. I don't think we really differ, Senator. What I'm merely suggesting to you is that these are question marks that I think that we should be concerned about. But they're not driving forces to the point where, which would mean that we should vote against this bill, or this amendment, meaning the ERA. No question in my mind. But in the course of debating these matters, certainly we should point out that these things do exist. We know that discrimination against women is labeled, and we've heard it here today, care, protection, humanitarianism. So s women seem to be among the favored. The Senator, if I were to take a poll right here, this male-dominated Senate, and ask how many males are prepared to change positions with that favored group, we wouldn't get too many yeses on that. So I suggest, Senator, that Senator Scrimmon, a good friend of mine, who wants to bring in other important issues. No question about it. But it when you mentioned something about the abortion bill, it reminded me of a statement which, which was made at the Constitutional Convention, and I've heard it, maybe not here, Senator Markey, you might recall it, um, said something to the effect that if you listen very carefully, you would believe that civil rights begin a conception, and then when the baby is born. And I think as we hear this business, I think perhaps it poses some serious su suggestions. <coughs> Madam President, I want to close by simply saying that I wanted this to be brought to the attention of the body. 
and reiterate the position that one isolated case does not necessarily make the whole. But I think that if we're moving in this direction, because certainly we're talking about the dual systems of responsibilities and rights, and we can't have it in this, in this country of ours. We're rapidly approaching 1976, and I think that we have a great deal to celebrate. There's a, most, a great deal that is wanting. And I think the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment will be a benefit because I'm not that exercised about a number of the issues that have been magnified by those who are opponents to ERA. I think history has proven this. Our Constitution, though it did not take certain minorities in consideration when it was being formulated, and I mean women at the same time because I'm sure the framers of this Constitution did not have, that, did not have women in mind. But I have faith in the Constitution because I think, very frankly, of the 14th Amendment and the First Amendment of privacy, as alluded to before, and a number of other amendments in our Constitution were actually being enforced, there would be no need for ERA. The reason why we've taken the third step or the second step is because... What is the point of order, Senator Reed? Madam President, it would be in order to request that the senators that speak pick up their mics because we back here in the back roads are very interested in what these senators are saying. And I would consider it a kindness to me, since I am very interested in what's going on, if the senators would please pick up their mics. And if the other senators and staff members would please stop interrupting and crossing. Senator Ruiz, the chair would observe that it was just difficult to hear you. And uh, therefore, perhaps the chair might admonish all the members of the body to pick up their own microphones. Senator Gallagher. Madam President, Senator Gallagher. Madam President, we will debate on this on our resolution command. Amendment. An amendment. The whole debate began at quarter after four, but the rules are not going to be enforced for this debate this afternoon, Senator.